question, so keep those in mind. Captain Baker is a retired U.S. Navy captain and NASA astronaut with a degree in aerospace engineering from the University of Texas. My, uh, yep, got some. Mike had an amazing 26 years career in the Navy. He was a test pilot and a test pilot instructor and has accomplished over 300 carrier arrested landings. He's flown over 50 different types of aircraft, including the space shuttle. During his 32 years with NASA, Mike served many different positions. He was the International Space Station Program Manager and the Assistant Director of NASA's Johnson Space Center across the street. Mike flew on four different space shuttle missions. He was the pilot of the first two and the commander for the next two missions. He is also one of very few space shuttle commanders to have docked the space shuttle with the Russian Mir Space Station. So please give a big round of applause to Captain Mike Baker! Thank you, Andrew. Please give us introduction. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here at Johnson Space Center, Space Center Houston with you guys. I have a lot to tell you, so I'll just jump right into it. Well, maybe I should start off with saying Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. I hope you had a good day. I always overindulge myself, so I feel like I'm a good 10 pounds more than I weighed 24 hours ago, but I uh, had a really good time. So what we're looking at here on the screen is my fourth, our crew pass for my fourth space shuttle mission, which was SDS-81. It's shaped like a Roman numeral five because it was the fifth docking mission with the Russian Space Station Mir. So I'll start with a little history. Remember back in 1991, the Soviet Union broke up and the International Space Station program had our partnership had already existed for a number of years. Partners got together and decided to ask uh, Russia to join the partnership which I think turned out to be one of the best ideas that we did, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in the presentation. But somebody had the idea, you know, we didn't know anything about the Russians, the Russians didn't know anything about us, so they said, we need a way to get to know them. So they came up with this idea of doing the Shuttle Mir program, or, the, or phase one of the International Space Station program. Phase two is the construction of a, a station, and uh, phase three is the utilization, which is where we are now, of course. So we decided to fly, um, 10 space shuttle missions to the Russian space station near the mid to late 90s, which is a lot of space shuttle missions, right? <laughs> and so um, our mission was pretty simple. We were supposed to exchange crew members and uh, resupply this station. So I'll jump right in here and we'll start talking about it. So actually, you know, when we, it's, if we hadn't done this shuttle mirror program, I don't think we would have been successful in building the uh, International Space Station together with our Russian partners. So that's, uh, I was really fortunate to have a very experienced crew. This picture reminds me of how long ago this was. Our mission was in January of 1997, about 26 years ago. Sitting down on the right there, that's me. Um, I used to have some hair. <laughs> Over here on the left is Brent Jett, who was uh, also a Navy test pilot like me. He was the pilot on the mission. Uh, behind him is Jeff Grunsfeld. I mean, John Grunsfeld, excuse me. Okay, right there, he was an astrophysicist before he became an astronaut. And next to John is John Blaha. John Blaha was an Air Force test pilot. He was the guy that was on the station. We're gonna pick him up and bring him home. And I think it's kind of interesting too. He was the commander on my first space shuttle mission in 1991. And in the center here is Jeff Weisoff. Jeff was also an astrophysicist before he became an astronaut. Um, like I said, we have a lot of those guys in the astronaut office, the really smart guys are good to have on your crew. Next to him is Jerry Leninger. Jerry was a medical doctor in the Navy. He was a flight surgeon, and he was the guy that was going to replace John on the station for about a three or four month mission. And on the far right is Marcia Ivins. Marcia was a flight test engineer for NASA before she became an astronaut. We launched in the middle of the night. You know, if you guys ever get a chance to see a, a launch, make sure you do that. And it's pretty easy now. Of course, you won't see a space shuttle, but you can see SpaceX. They're launching, believe it or not, like every five or seven days. And so if you're in Florida, it's a good chance to be able to see one. And they get the, you get to see their um, booster or first stage return to the launch site, which is kind of neat. So you may wonder why we launched in the middle of the night. Um, if you're gonna go rendezvous with the spacecraft in orbit, you have to launch when the plane of its orbit passes over your launch site, and that only occurs a couple of times a day. And so you can pick one of those opportunity based on other considerations like lighting and docking, for example. And here's a picture of the space shuttle when it first left the uh, launch pad. And I use this to tell you about how we get into space and how it felt. So you can see the space shuttle has these three main engines. They're 
liquid propellant engines that are, and the propellants have that big orange external tank. We also had two solid rocket motors, one on each side. And I'll point out another couple of engines. There's one there and one there. Those are orbital maneuvering system engines. We don't use those to get into space, but we'll use them while we're in orbit or we use them to get home. So what happens is about six to seven seconds before launch, we ignite the three main engines. They come up to 100% of their thrust. The uh, computers take a quick look at them, make sure they're working properly. And then we light the solid rocket motors. And when that happens, there's no returning because you can't turn them off. And so you jump off the launch pad at about two and a half G, uh, times the acceleration of gravity or 2.5 Gs, which is a big kick. It's a big acceleration. Um, I know it's kind of hard to imagine what that is, but if, I think it's easier if you think about an aircraft being catapulted off an aircraft carrier. That's about two and a half Gs of acceleration. So they go from like zero to 200 miles per hour in two to three seconds. And so it's a big kick, it's a big acceleration, and then on the shuttle launch, it lasts for the first two minutes while you're burning on the solid rocket motors. It's propellant and the solid rocket motors burns real rough, so there's lots of vibration during that first two minutes. And then at the end of the two minutes, when the propellant's all gone on the solid rocket motors, we jettisoned them, they fell back in the Atlantic Ocean on parachutes, were picked up by NASA boats, refurbished and reused on subsequent space shuttle missions. At that point, everything got really smooth, got a lot quieter. Uh, acceleration dropped way down from 2.5 Gs to just 0.8 Gs. So it felt like we actually stopped almost. And then as we use the propellant in the external tank, we slowly accelerate out to 3 Gs, which occurs about uh, seven and a half minutes into the flight. And at that point, we actually throttle the main engines back to maintain 3 Gs because that's a structural limitation of the space shuttle. And then in eight and a half minutes, the propellant's pretty much all gone. We're going 17,500 miles per hour, which is amazing. It's kind of hard to believe, actually. That's five miles a second. So we shut the main engines down. We go from three Gs to zero Gs, and we're in space. It's a really fairly quick ride and a lot of fun. And then the next thing that happens is we separate from the orange external tank, and it begins to tumble and breaks into pieces and fell in the Indian Ocean. The next thing we did is open up the payload bay doors. Uh, so this is a picture just after we open the payload bay doors, and I'll use this to uh, talk about a lot of different things. But in the foreground here is the docking mechanism. So this is where we were actually docked, uh, or attached to the space station. In the back you see that big white box it's called Space Hab. Uh, we carried about 6,000 pounds of cargo in there, things like food and clothing for the crew, uh, spare parts for the station, and experiments for the station. And it was connected to the front part of the space shuttle with a long 40-foot tunnel, which you'll see in a second too. And the other thing I want to talk about is our Earth. It's such a beautiful uh, sight when you look out the window. And, um, you know, on my first space shuttle mission, I had the first opportunity to look out the window. The thing that struck me the most is how deep, dark black space is. It's the deepest, darkest black I've ever seen. And the next thing that hits you right away is how thin our atmosphere is, how fragile looking our planet is, how beautiful it is, how small it looks, uh, how interconnected everything is. And you see this big, Beautiful, you know, blue and white marble sitting out in this deep, dark void of space, and you, you suddenly get hit with lots of emotions. One of them, you feel very lonely, I think. You look down at our beautiful planet, and you think, wow, I, we really need to take care of that place and live peacefully on it. It's a great perspective and um, a great experience. You never get tired of looking at our beautiful planet uh, from low Earth orbit. So we'll talk a lot about that. The next best thing about flying in space, I think, is zero gravity, being able to float around uh, and it's just pure simple fun. So there's that tunnel I talked about. We could grab, just for example, we could grab those handles on either side of this tunnel and go shooting down this tunnel like a, like a bullet. We did that quite a bit, had a lot of fun. And so we'll talk more about that as well. So on day two is when we started getting serious about doing the rendezvous. And this is what the space station looked like when we were about half a mile away. This whole process of doing the rendezvous and docking is very slow, almost like watching grass grow, as I said. Um, and this is look, how it looked from inside the cockpit. So that's me at the bottom looking out the overhead window, and there you can see uh, the space station as it gets a little bit closer. In a nicer, clearer picture, I point out one thing here. Right here is this orange uh, module you see with those white circles. That's a docking adapter that we took up on our very first space shuttle mission, which really was just an extension to keep us a little bit further away from the station when we were docked, and you'll see why that was important in a second. So that was our target, that's where we were headed. And this is what it looked like when we got docked. So this is a, in the foreground here is the uh, solar array panel, which you, you know, we used to collect energy from the sun, turn it into electricity to power the station. It was only about three feet from the overhead window. Uh, and this is the main base block of the station. 
And right there, you see a little porthole. That was the cosmonaut crew quarters, our sleeping quarters. Later on, you see some pictures taken from that porthole back at the nose of the shuttle, which is kind of pretty. And again, you see our beautiful planet. Over here is this nice water. You see is the uh, Pacific Ocean, and the land you see is the west coast of South America. So that's the country of Chile looking south along the Andes Mountains. Same picture taken with a wide-angle lens just to remind me to tell you that we use a lot of different lenses on the space shuttle. There's, you know, a, a wide-angle lens like this and a 50 millimeter standard uh, camera lens is kind of what it looks like to the naked eye when you look out the window. And we also had a 100 millimeter telephoto lens and a 300 millimeter telephoto lens. And I'll try to tell you which lens we're using, when, especially when we're looking at uh, Earth photography. So the next thing we did was open up some valves to equalize the pressure between the station and the space shuttle. And that allowed us to open up the hatch and say hello to the crew. So they were really happy to see us because they've only seen the three of them for like the previous three months or so. This is the picture of Jeff in the main base block to give you an idea of what it looked like. The main base block is like the main control center for the station. has also served like this, the light, the living room, the bedroom, the dining room. Most of the activities that took place in the station took place in this module. Um, the space has had been on orbit for about nine years when we got there. It was only designed to be on orbit for five years and ended up staying on orbit for 15. Uh, the, it, just by comparison, the International Space Station was designed to be on orbit for 15. It's already been on orbit since 1998. It just had an anniversary, so it's been on orbit for 25 years already. Um, and we hope to keep flying until at least 2030. So that's just a picture of me and the, with the two cosmonauts that were on board. The guy on the right is Glary Corzoon, on the left, Sasha Glary. Uh, I've been working with these guys since 1995 until just a couple of years ago when kind of we, all three of us kind of retired. Uh, Valeri on the right ended up as a uh, general in the Russian Air Force and he was also the director of the uh, Gagarin Cosmonaut Training Center in Star City just outside of Moscow, which is the equivalent to the Johnson Space Center here. So we both, all three of us ended up flying like four space, or space missions and I have 40 days in space and they ended up with like two years in space. So it's kind of the difference between our, our programs. The shuttle program, we flew short missions and the Russians tended to fly longer missions, and of course now everybody's flying six month missions or longer. So this is a picture of Jerry. The first thing that Jerry did was get into a space suit uh, that he would use on the Soyuz spacecraft. Uh, and once he checked out, he officially became part of the space station crew, and John Blaha became part of my space shuttle crew, which was important to know because if you needed, if there was some sort of emergency on orbit and you need to evacuate the station, you needed to know which spacecraft to go to. And so this is the Soyuz spacecraft. This is what the Russians used to get their crew members back and forth uh, to the station. And um, this is probably the main reason why it was such a good idea for us to have the Russians join as partners. Because you may remember back in 2003, we lost the space shuttle Columbia on re-entry. And when that happened, uh, we lost all of our capability uh, to get our astronauts to and from the station. So during that period of time when the space shuttle wasn't flying, we relied on our Russian partners to get our astronauts to and from the station. And then in 2011, uh, we stopped flying the space shuttle completely. It's kind of hard to believe it was 12 years ago. Uh, and during, for, so for 10 years, we depended on our Russian partners to get all of the International Space Station partners, astronauts to and from the station. So the good news is about three years ago, we started flying uh, astronauts from the U.S. soil again at Kennedy Space Center using SpaceX Crew Dragon. And uh, Boeing is also getting ready to fly next year, hopefully the CST-100 Starliner. And then we'll have three ways of getting to the station, which is a really good position to be in. So this is a picture of John and Jerry in the base block. On the left, Jerry's now wearing kind of the costume or the uniform that the Russians would wear. And on the right, John is wearing what we'd wear on the space shuttle, which is just a golf shirt and a pair of shorts. And then we started transferring our 6,000 pounds of cargo. This is, John's got a thermos in his hand. This is the return, we were returning some samples that needed to stay frozen uh, to Earth from a, a nice experiment they had on board. This is an example of one of the spare parts we brought up. It's called a gyrodyne. It's nothing more than a big gyro. I always think it's kind of interesting. They had each, they had one of these gyros attached to each of the three main axes of the station. And they used these gyros to maintain the attitude of the station or change the attitude of the station so they didn't have to use uh, reaction control jets and propellant. And so we use that same kind of technique on board the uh, International Space Station. And you can also see this is, 
They're located in the back end of that space hab. You can see how things, how that 6,000 pounds of cargo was stowed uh, back there in the back. And just another picture showing how fun, much fun it is to be able to zero gravity, be able to float around. I also have to tell you at the same time, just about every ordinary task that we do is more difficult than zero gravity, but it is a lot of fun to, to uh, play around in zero gravity. So there's a picture of the nose of the shuttle looking from that porthole I showed you earlier. I think it's a beautiful picture. Again, you see this deep, dark blackness of space and our thin atmosphere. Is, we, in our beautiful planet, we happen to be over what's called the terminator of the point on the Earth where it goes from night to day. I'll point out another few things on the here. These holes you see there are the nozzles for the reaction control jet on the space shuttle, which we use to maintain our attitude, change our attitude, and translate while we're on orbit. These are the forward-looking windows, and over here you can see uh, the overhead windows, and at the very top is a KU band antenna, which we use for voice and data communication. And right here you see another couple of holes. Those are star trackers, which we use to align our inertial navigation system. So this is the east coast of the United States. Looking out that, that porthole from the space station again, you can see the nose of the shuttle. You can easier see the overhead windows here. You can see how close that solar array panel is to the overhead windows. You can see the pay bay door, which is kind of cool. Uh, and like I said, this is the east coast of the United States. So um, out here is the Atlantic Ocean. And you know, one of the first things that you notice is you don't really see any pit in these cities, right? So if you're looking for places on the ground and you want to find cities, you have to study your geography before you go flying. So you can pick out things that are really easy to see. Geographic features like this is Cape Hatteras up here, which happens to be right next to Keyhawk, where the Wright brothers started flying airplanes for the first time in 1903. Uh, you can see this big body of water up there. That's the Chesapeake Bay. That's easy to find, too. And so, for, just for an example, if you're trying to find Norfolk, Virginia, you know that Norfolk uh, sits where the Chesapeake Bay opens into the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, and it's kind of hard to see right now. Uh, right there is where Norfolk is. And so if you got your 100 millimeter telephoto lens out, you could take a nice picture of Norfolk. So after four days, we had finished transferring all of our cargo. So we said goodbye to the crew. We closed the hatch, we undocked, and we moved out to about 100, 150 feet away from the station. We performed two 360 degree fly arounds of the station, which was a lot of fun. We took a lot of pictures of the station. We sent those pictures back to Moscow. The engineers were able to take a look at them and, um, you know, to get an idea of the condition of the external um, part of the space station. So it's kind of neat. I'll point out some modules here. This is the main base block. Down here is the Soyuz spacecraft we talked about. At the top is another spacecraft that looks like a Soyuz, but it's an unmanned cargo spacecraft called Progress. So they would use that to resupply the station. Uh, and so they'd send one up about every three to four months. And when it would arrive, the crew would unload it. And then they would use it as a trash can. And then right before the next progress would come up, they'd undock it, deorbit it, and it would burn up in the atmosphere. And you can also see these four research modules around this central node. At the end of this research module called Crystal, you can see that orange docking adapter. So right there at the end of that uh, docking adapter is where the space shuttle was attached when we were docked to the station. And then we used our reaction control jets to slowly move away from the station. So the next uh, set of pictures is just uh, as we get a little bit further and further away from the station. You know, sometimes the solar array panels have this pretty blue color. Uh, sometimes they, had, they looked gold or black. Um, and then in this picture, we're getting a little bit further away with the station out on the horizon. You can see that deep dark blackness of space or very thin atmosphere in our beautiful blue and white marble of a planet that you would never get tired of looking at from space. And then one of my favorite pictures, now we're directly overhead, uh, the station right here. And you can see we're over this beautiful island down here at the bottom. You can see some glaciers in the valley and some glacial lakes. This is the South Island of New Zealand. Really beautiful spot. I've never been there on the ground, but I'd like to do that one of these days. And so this is the picture of me sitting in the commander's seat. I've got a big, large, I got a point here, the, the uh, big, large format camera here, another camera up here, Velcro to the instrument panel. We had another six cameras or so with different lenses on them, uh, Velcro, Velcro near all the windows that were ready to pick up and use as we pass something. So this is beginning to talk about more looking at our beautiful planet. So this is a picture of a sunset or a sunrise. Very beautiful, taken with a 300 millimeter telephoto lens. So we're looking at some thunderstorms way out on the horizon. And it reminds me, remember we're going five miles a second? 
So we're going around the earth every 90 minutes. So every 45 minutes we had a sunset or a sunrise, which is pretty cool. And they're very, very beautiful. Another neat thing to see from space is the aurora. This is the aurora Australia, so the southern lights. We were also lucky to see a, a volcano erupting. This is a volcano, it's called the Kluchevskoy volcano in the far eastern part of Russia on the Kamchatka Peninsula, which is located on the Ring of Fire around the Pacific Ocean where lots and lots of volcanoes are at. And I guess we were very lucky, this volcano he started erupting about the same time that we launched. So on this, this was my third flight. Uh, when the, the first time that we looked out the window, we got to see this uh, volcano erupting. And we also got to fly right over the top of it. So this picture was taken with a 100 millimeter telephoto lens, so it's about 50 miles across on the ground. But you can see all these other volcanic cones in the area. Uh, next to the one that's erupting, you can see this one is smoking, and there's uh, some lava flow coming down the side of that one. Really spectacular sight. So this is the city of Denver, Colorado. Like I said, cities are hard to find. They look like just big gray smudges. So this, this is the city of Denver, Colorado. It's kind of a, basically a pretty flat area at an elevation of about 5,000 feet. It's a 100 millimeter telephone lens, about 50 miles across here, but it's really easy to see this geographic feature. So this is the front range of the Rocky Mountains. You know, so you go from 5,000 feet here to a little bit less than 15,000 feet over here in a very short distance. And it forms that nice straight line, which is really easy to see from space. And once you find that, you can um, use some other geographic features to help you find the cities. And I always like to point out, especially as a pilot, you know, runways are easy to see from space. So out here, over here at the top right, you can see the four runways out in international at their international airport. And then to give you an idea how it changes from season to season, this is the city of Colorado taken from the I mean, Denver, Colorado, taken from the same point in space uh, with snow cover on the ground. You can still see the front range of the Rocky Mountains pretty easy, so that helps you find the city, but it's a little bit fine, harder to see the city. It's just this big gray smudge, but I think it's also interesting. You can still see the runway out here at the International Airport. And this is the uh, state of California. I grew up in California. It's a beautiful state, so I like to show pictures of it. Um, this was taken with a 50 millimeter lens, so it's pretty much what it looked like to the naked eye when you look out the window. But you can clearly see the big, long central valley of California. It's a valley that's about 450 miles long, 75 miles across or so. Um, over here on the top left, the snow-covered Sierra Nevada Mountains, which is where Mount Whitney is at, the highest point on the continental United States. It's also where Yosemite National Park is located, which is a beautiful spot. If you've never been, you should make sure you plan on going sometime. Uh, and I was lucky enough to grow up in the Central Valley, right about there, just out, not too far from Yosemite Valley. You can also see San Francisco Bay right there. At the very top is Los Angeles. And this kind of light tan um, triangular area you see there is the Mojave Desert, which is where Edwards Air Force Base is at, which is where we did all the initial landing tests for the space shuttle using that 747 that you see outside. So on the same orbit, we got to fly right over the top of San Francisco Bay. So this is kind of just a fun, pretty picture, taken with a 100 millimeter telephoto lens. So it's about 50 miles across. I think it's neat. You can see all the bridges crossing the bay. Um, one there is called the famous one, the Golden Gate Bridge, there's the Bay Bridge there. There's an island right there, a very famous prison called Alcatraz. You can see the runways right there is San Francisco's International Airport right across the bay. There's another runway right there. That's Oakland International Airport. And you might be able to make out an X right there. That's two runways at Naval Air Station Alameda, where I was stationed for a little while, which is a very fun place to fly out of. And these dark areas that you see here and here are vegetation. So this rectangle you see is a Golden Gate Park. Uh, just kind of a fun picture. And then this is San Francisco Bay at nighttime. Uh, you can still see the bridges going across the bay, which I think is neat. And it just reminds me, you know, my first space shuttle mission I tried to get all my work done during the, the nighttime passes so that I could look out the window during the daytime. But at one point I had to fly, uh, float up to the uh, flight deck to get something. And we happened to be heading northeast up over the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. And when I got up there and I looked out the window, I couldn't believe what I saw. I could see the entire you know, uh, Gulf of Mexico and the, the peninsula of the state of Florida all the way up the east coast of the United States to New York all outlined in lights and it was just a spectacular sight. 
So I decided I need to look out the window all the time. Unfortunately, they don't let us do that. So this is another city. Uh, I'll point out some things again too. This, you know, geographic features like this, this is the Chesapeake Bay again. This was taken with a 100 millimeter telephoto lens, but looking out at an angle. And if you know, if you're looking for Washington, D.C., which happens to be in the very center of this picture, um, and you're, you're, you know that the Potomac River runs through Washington, D.C., it helps you find it. So it's, here's the Potomac River, it's easy to find. Over here's the Patuxent River. Uh, but if you follow the Potomac River up, you can see some sediment coming out right there. And then right here, where it narrows down, is where Washington, D.C. is at. And once you find that and know where everything is there, you can see over here, that's Baltimore, Maryland. And you can see a bridge going across the Chesapeake Bay. There's not very many of those. And if you know where that bridge is, uh, it'll help you find other things. Like right in here is where Annapolis, Maryland is at, where the U.S. Naval Academy is at. And I mentioned over here is Patuxent River. You may see some runways right there. That's where the Naval Air Test Center at Patuxent uh, River is in Maryland, which is where the U.S. Navy Test Pilot School is at, which is where I spent about three years of my Navy career. It's another volcano, I like volcanoes. This is Mount Vesuvius in Italy, very famous one. Uh, so there's the volcano. But you know, it reminds me to tell you that we can image the Earth in different ways. Um, and so we can use visual photography, we can use infrared photography, we can use radar, and we get different information from each one of those ways that we can image the Earth. And so if you're interested in the structure of this volcano, if you use infrared, uh, film, you can get more details of the structure of the volcanoes uh, right in there. And all these information that you get from the red that you see is means that there's more vegetation on the ground. And this is a neat picture of the Himalaya Mountains, 100 millimeter telephone lens again, about 50 miles across. You can see all those ribbons of glaciers running throughout the valleys. And right in the very center of this picture, uh, right there is Mount Everest, the highest point on our beautiful planet. In another city, this is, this is the city of Cairo in Egypt. So what you see here is the Nile River as it opens up in here to the Nile River Delta. And right off the top of the picture, Edward empties into the Mediterranean Sea. So it's really dark there because there's lots of vegetation in the del Delta with all the water that's available. And there's also a big contrast between the, the River Delta and the Sahara Desert. We always get asked, can you see things like the Great Wall of China or can you see the Great Pyramids? For... And the answer to that question is no, you cannot, not with the naked eye when you look out the window. But if you know where to look and you break out your 300 millimeter telephoto lens, you can take a good picture of the pyramids, for example. So right in this area is where the pyramids are at. And again, if you take your 300 millimeter telephoto lens, you can take a pretty good picture of it. I think it's pretty cool. This is a picture of Houston, Texas. Not that good, but... Um, I'll reorient you here. This is the northern part of the, the Gulf of Mexico. This is Galveston Island, and this is Galveston Bay right there. And right in there, you may see some dark areas. That's where Clear Lake is, and that's right outside of uh, Johnson Space Center. And so you can see Interstate Highway 45 going up to downtown Houston here. But I use this to remind me to tell you about our crew members when they're going, getting prepared or training for a, a six-month mission on board the International Space Station. Uh, their typical schedule is that, it, well, it takes, first of all, it takes about two to two and a half years of training. Uh, and their typical schedule will be about three or four weeks here at Johnson Space Center where they're learning about the U.S. segment of the station. They're learning about um, SpaceX Crew Dragon, if they're going to fly on that. They're learning how to do spacewalks. They're learning how to use the robotic arm. Uh, they're learning some Russian language. And then they'll, they'll spend about three to four weeks in Moscow at the Gagarin Cosmonaut Training Center learning about the Russian segment of the space station. If they're going to fly the Soyuz, they'll learn about the Soyuz and they'll brush up on their Russian language. So this is a, a fun picture of Moscow, 100 millimeter telephoto lens again, about 50 miles across. Uh, you can see this big river running through, it's called the Moscow River. And right at the top of the bend in the river, there is where the Kremlin and the Red Square is at. The, center of Moscow. You can see a bunch of runways running around Moscow. Up here at the top left is the center of runways. That's their international airport called Chermetro. On the top right you see some other long runways. That's a Russian Air Force base called Chikolovsky. And just outside of Chikolovsky you might be able to make out some, a group of buildings. That's where the Gagarin Cosmonaut Training Center is, about 25 miles from the center of Moscow. And so uh, they'll, they'll also uh, spend some time in Europe learning about the European modules, some time in Japan learning, learning about the, 
Japanese module and spend time in Canada learning about the Canadian arm. And then uh, at the end of their two and a half years of training, when they're ready to go launch, if they're going to launch on the Soyuz spacecraft, they launch from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in the center of Asia, in the center of Kazakhstan, which used to be part of the Soviet Union, but now Russia leases the Cosmodrome from Kazakhstan. And it, it happens to be out here. Let me, oops. Uh, this is the Aral Sea, by the way, so the Cosmodrome is out here northeast of the Aral Sea. And if they're launching from this, uh, on the U.S., from the SpaceX Crew Dragon, they're launching from Kennedy Space Center, so this is a really beautiful picture, I think. But up here you see the peninsula of the state of Florida. About halfway down the peninsula, about right in there, is where Kennedy Space Center is at. So that's where we launch all of our astronauts from. You can also see Lake Okeechobee right there. You can see the Florida Keys. This big island you see is Cuba. And this group of islands and beautiful blue water you see there is the Bahamas. And so I always say every good thing must come to an end, right? So at the end of about 11 days, we're ready to come home. This is what the mid-deck looked like when we were preparing to do the deorbit burn. So we had lined up all of our uh, orange launch and entry suits, getting ready to put them on inside these brown bags. We had everything we needed for re-entry, which included our helmets, our parachutes, and a flight data file. And then we did the deorbit burn. And remember, we're going five miles a second. We weigh about 220,000 pounds, so we got a lot of energy to dissipate. And so we do this deorbit burn about halfway around the world. So if we're going to land in Florida, we do it somewhere over Australia. And once we do the burn, it takes us about an hour to touch down. So what happens is we turn the shuttle around, we point those orbital maneuvering system engines in the velocity vector, and we fire the engines off for about four minutes. And what that does is it slows us down. And when you slow down, you just fall out of your orbit. So we spend the next 30 minutes just free falling until we uh, start entering the atmosphere. And then when we enter the atmosphere, we still have about 30 minutes to go before touchdown. Um, and, you know, at that point, I was kind of thinking that we might feel a little turbulence or something, but almost nothing. Uh, the whole entry is very, very smooth and very gentle, basically. Um, you know, we go from zero G to one G over a very short period, I mean, a long period of time, like 20 minutes or so. So the onset of G is very gradual, very gentle. Of course, when we do hit the atmosphere, we're starting generating a lot of friction, a lot of heat. Uh, the shuttle nose gets to like 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So it does get pretty hot outside. Uh, we start ionizing the gas out there and it looks like we're on fire, but inside it's very comfortable and you don't really notice too much uh, looking out the window, unless you're able to look out the overhead windows. And so what happens is hopefully, what happens anyway, is you get below about 50,000 feet when you're overhead your landing site uh, and you're also decelerating below Mach 1, which is when we took over manual control of the space shuttle. And we flew around this heading alignment cone at about 300 knots in a 20 degree dive angle, which is kind of relatively steep. Uh, and then the highest G level that we get on entry is as we turn, we're turning the shuttle to line up on the runway. It goes about 1.4 Gs, which is what you would experience on a commercial airliner whenever it does like a 30 degree bang at turn. Uh, so it's a very low G level. And then what we do as we're passing through 2,000 feet, lined up on the runway, we start to raise the nose to reduce the glide path uh, from 20 degrees to 3 degrees, which is what a normal commercial airliner would make its final approach at. And then um, as we're passing through 400 feet, we lower the landing gear and hopefully touch down on the end of the runway just like this uh, at about 195 knots, which is pretty fast. Just a comparison, if, we, if you're on a commercial airliner, you touch down about 125 knots. And then as we decelerate below by 185 knots, we start to lower the nose of the runway and deploy our drag chute. And I'm gonna stop talking <laughs> and see if there's any, actually I'm kind of over already, but if we, anybody has a question or so, I'll be happy to answer. Let's start down here. First, thank you for being here and sharing your experience. Second of all, when you were in like grade school and middle school, what was your favorite subject? When I was in grade school, what was my favorite subject? And I think I always liked math. <laughs> so I was hoping you'd Everything that. depends on math, right? Yay. Are you a math teacher? Uh -huh. are, you, are you a math teacher? No, but I love math. <laughs> Good. Anybody else? Yes. Yes. Yeah, we, we stay in touch pretty much. We, do I know all, all the people that I flew with? We know, you know, it's, there's not very many of us. <laughs> in the whole world, and we actually have 
an association called the Association of Space Explorers, which is kind of a fun group. Uh, it's made up of anybody that's been in space from all around the world, and once a year we get together. We just got together in um, September in Turkey. So that was pretty cool, actually. So we got guys from all over the world, the cosmonauts, a bunch of cosmonauts were there, a bunch of us were there, a bunch of people from Europe. So yeah, we keep up and we do, we try to do a reunion like once every other year here in, in Houston. Good question. Anybody else? Maybe one more. I can take, what the blue, yeah, there you go. What's your biggest adjustment when you come back to Earth? Well, well, that's a kind of a long answer. Because <laughs> I think you have to understand what happens to you when you go to space first, right? Before you understand how to, what happens to you coming back. But I can go over it real quickly if you guys don't mind. You know, so when you go to space, we actually have a name for that. It's called Space Adaptation Syndrome. And it's a little bit like motion sickness. Uh, some people get it less than others, but just about everybody gets a little bit of it, like nausea, like, like motion sickness. Uh, most people don't get very ill at all. Um, so what happens is, you know, the first when you don't have gravity pulling your blood down in your body, your legs get skinny. Some people like that. Uh, but it, it, so the blood goes up in your body. It puts pressure on your diaphragm, which is a signal to your brain that you have too much fluid. So we lose about a third of our blood volume, which is a lot. But the good news is you don't need it in space, zero gravity. You do need it when you get home. So that's one of the problems when we come home. Uh, what else happens? You grow about two inches because your spine's no longer compressed. You no longer have this sensory input from your inner ear because it requires gravity, you know, to move those little hairs around that, that we use for balance. And I think that may contribute a little bit to the nausea that, that some people feel. And also when you come back, it's important, you know, some guys have gone on a six month mission, they no longer, they haven't had this sensory input from their inner ear for six months and all, and all of a sudden they do have it. Um, your muscles atrophy, we lose bone mass, uh, mass. Those are serious things that we have to take, you know, worry about when we're in space. Um, so what the way they take, handle that is they exercise uh, every day for like two and a half hours. We use a, a treadmill because we discovered that impact uh, help reduce uh, bone loss mass or bone mass loss. <laughs> um, and we also have this thing called an advanced resistive exercise device or ARAD, which is nothing more than this big fancy uh, weight machine that works uh, in zero gravity. And so we're using that two, two and a half hours a day and our guys are coming back in pretty good shape. Their muscles are in pretty good shape. Um, they're a little wobbly, not, not completely uh, walking straight, but they're in pretty good shape. And so, you know, one of the, one of the ways we worry about the blood volume is um, we'll take salt tablets and a lot of water right before the re-entry that will help us retain some uh, water volume and help us from keeping us from passing out. <laughs> so, good question. I think, unfortunately, I don't have any more time for any other questions, but thank you very much. I hope you really enjoyed the rest of your visit here at the Space Center Houston. Thank you.